Park. It's a pleasure to be here. We're glad you're here with, with us in person and online. So my name is Lizzie. If anyone knows me really well, I love the Christmas season, and I celebrate Christmas four months of the year. Never mind two weeks, four months of the year, solid. I start watching movies in September. Okay, and Christmas is just, it just brings joy and peace to my heart. So during these pandemic times, it's been so hard that I can't hug you all because I'm a hugger. I love hugging people. So we really hope you feel connected and loved this morning, even though we can't hug. I give you air hugs today. All right. Um, if you have questions during the service, we have Nancy in the foyer. If you have any questions at all, you have concerns, go see Nancy. And online, we have Laura Ann. So make sure you touch base with Laura Ann. You can click on that prayer request button and ask away any of your questions. Let's turn to scripture this morning to get started. So if you have your device or your Bible in hand, let's turn to Micah chapter 5. We're going to read verse 2, and then we're going to jump over to Luke chapter 2. So starting in Micah chapter 5, and then put your finger in Luke chapter 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And then Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swallowing claws and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's bow in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Father God, we praise your name and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness, your love, your wisdom in our lives, Lord God. And we pray as we, we prepare our hearts this morning to hear your word, the truth, Lord, that we would remove all distraction and focus in on you. Lord, we pray over our community, our city, our province, our country, Lord God. We pray wisdom for the leadership and that we would be a light, a light to those around us, especially during this Christmas season. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lizzie, and good morning, Bay Park. Good morning, church, and welcome. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing some Christmas carols together, remembering Jesus' birth and, and just spending some time to celebrate that.
together before we move into getting to celebrate a baptism. Um, so this next song, I'm going to invite you to imagine with childlike imagination. I remember as a kid having this beautiful mem- imagination, and I think it's a gift from God. And it's a way that it helps us to wonder at some of the truths that are hard to under- understand. And so that passage in Luke that Lizzie read, as we think about the birth of Jesus and the wonder that the Savior King was born in a manger and clothed in humanity and yet the fullness of deity. And so as we sing this song, imagine in your mind's eye and yet use that as a tool to guide you to worship.
praise Him this morning and we give Him all the glory and we thank Him for what He's done for us? How can you sing a song like that and not just connect? Connect with our Lord and Savior. Once again, we welcome you here this morning. This is our second Sunday of Advent. And so we want you to feel welcomed. We want you to feel connected and loved while you're here. You can touch base with Nancy in the foyer or online. You can touch base with Laura Ann by pressing that request prayer button if you have any questions or concerns. Our children in the Sunday school program, their curriculum is all about Christmas right now. So they are studying up on Emmanuel. Who is Emmanuel? And what is Christmas really about? Why do we celebrate on December 25th? And so you will see in the weeks to come already, they've started the huge tree in the foyer. They're putting some crafts. The crafts correspond with the lessons each week. So make sure you take a look. Ask your kids what are the meanings for each craft. And it'll be a time you can share with your family and friends. And you can watch what's going on as they learn about the true meaning of Christmas. This reminds us we have a little bit of an update. So all these ministries that we run through Bay Park as we are a light in our community, as we glorify God with our tithes and offerings, it gives us a reminder we can only do that because of your offering. And so we thank you, Bay Park, for giving throughout the year. So our update today is 552000 was our budget in October. We are only at 509000 so we have a bit of a gap. And so as we approach year end, we're, we're asking that you consider what special offering you can give to Bay Park so that we glorify God in our ministries and that we continue to be a light here in our community. <clears throat> so we have a few announcements this morning. Bear with me. Next Sunday, don't forget, we're changing the service time. So Pull out your phones, pull out your calendar, wherever you mark in your mind as well. Services will be changing. Right now we're 8.30 and 10. Next Sunday we're switching 9 o'clock and 10.30. The 10.30 service will be our live stream time, just like it is now. Our second service is live streamed for those who don't join us in person. Keep in mind also Christmas Eve is coming quickly. I don't know how many more sleeps. Uh-oh, I'm slacking. I didn't count sleeps. All right, so usually kids count in sleeps how many days till Christmas, right? So Christmas Eve, we have a 4.30 service and a 6 o'clock service. So that you can join us in person and online again. All right, I have a quote for you from the Grinch this morning. We'll, we'll be focusing on the true meaning of Christmas. And so the Grinch said in his movie... Christmas came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? And so this morning we get to see a little bit more of what Christmas means to us because of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. But first, he came. He came to us at Christmas time. And so Jesus redeems us, he restores us, and he invites us into a relationship with him that gives us hope and new life. And this morning, we get to see an example of that with a baptism. Baptism is an outward expression of an inner decision, a decision to follow Christ and accept that gift. And so we welcome Doug to join us and Dylan this morning. Doug and Dylan will have a time of testimony together. And um, the baptism happened during first service, but you'll get to hear the testimony now. Well, good morning. Uh, this, uh, the first service, I had the privilege of baptizing uh, Dylan, um, and what a joy it is. Uh, when um, a person is baptized, uh, they're following the command of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus uh, was baptized by John the Baptist, and he said in, after, just before his ascension, uh, go and make disciples, teaching 
and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, uh, when a person uh, is baptized, they identify themselves as being a Christian, as being a forgiven one um, of the Lord. And also, there's a symbolic act as well, a visual act. Uh, if you look at Romans chapter 6, when you go down into the waters, you are identifying yourselves with the death, burial, and then as you come up out of the water, uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I, it, it was just a great privilege to uh, baptize uh, Dylan this morning in this tank behind us, and I'm going to ask Dylan to come and, and share his testimony, what God has done in his life. Good morning. I, over the years, have come to love Sunday and come to find it my favorite day of the week. I remember when Sunday, when everything was closed except for churches, gas stations, and maybe the grocery store. And I find joy in it, and I find joy in the Sabbath and peace and solace now. My name is Dylan. I've been coming to Bay Park for a couple months now, and you'll shortly hear why. But I've been a Christian by, by name my whole life for 30 years. But I've been a saved Christian for about seven years of my life. I grew up in a strong family. Um, although my parents were separated, I had a wonderful mother who provided everything for my brother and I and then some. We never went without, and we probably had more than we needed. I went off to university and developed mental health issues and a drug addiction. And I spent about nine years of my life self-medicating my mental health with my drug addiction. It got to the point where I was, I had a wonderful job, I was a functioning drug addict, I was doing what most people and what my friends and family thought I was doing incredible. No one knew. And it got to the point where one day on a Tuesday afternoon, I was at Dufferin Station in Toronto and I was on the subway tracks. And I was ready to end my life. I had come to the point where I had nothing. I had given up the church, I had given up Christ. And at that point, I knew it, it was over. And that's where I was at in my life. And an older gentleman reached out his cane and he said to me, it's not worth it. And I got off the tracks, and about 20 seconds later, the train came. I called my pastor, who was through my previous church, and within 72 hours, I was in a rehab center. I was not happy. I was opposed to my Christianity at the time. My mom, very strong Christian, my brother as well, and I, was, I felt like I was the black sheep. So. I refused a Christian center. When I went to this center that was very secular, out of the 20 counselors that were there, the counselor I had was a youth pastor on the side. That was his secondary job. And that is such a strong example of when God is calling you, you must answer the phone. He will keep calling and keep calling and he will maintain in your life as long as, he, as long as you need. I came out of rehab sober, and I met my partner and my previous partner, and uh, we had a daughter, and my mental health continued to deteriorate. I was not managing it well. I was not doing anything properly. I was, frankly, I was doing it terribly. I, again, I lived about three minutes from my church, and I refused to go on Sundays. I wasn't going. I wasn't... My pastors would call me. I, I just had no interest. And my life just continued to go downhill. I now ended up... I was at about 27 years of age, and for the first time in my life, I got a criminal record. I was not on drugs, but I was not managing my mental health well. And I spent 21 months in the provincial system in Ontario, and I went from Lindsay to Penetang to Brockville. In Brockville, 
I met a pastor who was an elder at the Baptist Church in Brockville. And I had access to the best doctors in Canada. And he was probably the most beneficial person in my treatment because he brought the Lord our Savior back into my life. I started to read and pray and just spend my time with things that are of Christ and not of the world. And I became whole again and healthy. There's a great theologian that said once, we are all instruments of Christ and that he is the master conductor. And I think that is very important for us to remember that we are here as instruments and we, we may not be counselors, we may not be doctors or someone that is helping you in your everyday life, but if we help someone in their walk and in bring them to their faith. And D.L. Moody was one of the most famous evangelists and he was told that, you know, he spent every day he had to tell one person about the Lord. And there was a story that one night he was about, probably about midnight, and I guess he had not met his quota for the day. And he went outside in the pouring rain in his pajamas and found a man and asked him, can I share your umbrella and you know who Jesus is? And to me, that is so important that we continue to share and let people know who Jesus is. Right now, I am in a great spot in my life. I'm happy. I have a wonderful partner who supports me. I have a wonderful family back in my life. But today I was baptized because I am a sinner. And I was given God's grace. And through his grace alone, I was saved. And for that, I thank you, Bay Park, for allowing me to have my baptism here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dylan. Uh, Dylan is part of our life group, and it, it's uh, over the, the last several weeks, I've really gained, uh, grown to appreciate his heart. And um, we'll uh, continue to, uh, let's just, Continue as we uh, will pray for Dylan and just thank God for uh, this act of uh, baptism that he underwent this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Dylan. We thank you, Lord, for his testimony. We thank you, Lord, most of all for the way that you rescued him from a path that wasn't a good path and you brought him into the right path. And Lord, we, we just pray you'll bless Dylan in the days to come that he'll grow in grace and the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Lord, that he'll be part of the, the body, the family of, of Jesus here at Bay Park, and that he'll serve you as a servant of the Lord. So Lord, we just give you thanks and give you praise for what you have done in his life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, Bay Park, we're going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing together a couple more songs. This morning, we're going to kick off this next set with joy to the world because there is so much joy to celebrate because of the birth of Jesus. And that testimony reminded me that the joy of our salvation is found that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And truly, that is something incredible to celebrate.
just praise you, Jesus, that you are such an awesome God, deserving of all our praise, and yet you know us so intimately, so perfectly. You know what it's like to be human, and you met us where we are, and so we thank you for that. We're going to sing through that chorus, reflecting on who Jesus is. And I just invite you to think it through with the story of Christmas. Such an awesome God, so mighty, so holy, so wonderful. Such an
Christmas isn't just a time to decorate your house, to spend time with loved ones, and to open long-awaited presents. Christmas is a time to remember, to remember that salvation doesn't come from within, it comes from above. To remember that infinitely better than the magic of Christmas is the miracle of Emmanuel. To remember that God was not and is not untouched by the pain and suffering of this world. To remember that Jesus isn't just part of the Christmas story, but Christmas is part of the Jesus story. To remember that there is no grace without a cross and no cross without a manger. To remember that Jesus doesn't just want us to remember what he did, but to join him in what he is doing. So this year, let the lights remind you of the light of the world who came into darkness for us. Let the gifts remind you of the greatest gift of all. And this year, make your heart like Bethlehem and receive the King. Good morning. My name is Ryan, if you don't know me, and I'm the associate pastor at Bay Park part-time, and I also work on Queen's campus in student ministry part-time. And we are carrying on in our sermon series entitled, What If Christmas Means a Little Bit More? The Grinch was already quoted this morning, so I'll, I'll quote it again. What if Christmas means a little bit more than boxes and bags, bows and tags? What if Christmas means that God hears us? What if Christmas means that God hears our fears? Let's pray. God, we pray that as that video said, our hearts would be like Bethlehem, ready to receive our King, King Jesus. God, we pray that you'd speak to us through your word encourage us. Lord, lift us up where we need it. Challenge us where we need it. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. So you can open up if you want. It will be on the screen. Luke 5, sorry, Luke 1, 5 to 25. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well long in years once Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. 
many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well long in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I am I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to you to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed in the temple so long. When he came out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has, take, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Speaking of fear, I love that scene in A Charlie Brown Christmas when Charlie waltzes up to the self-declared Dr. Lucy and confesses, I'm in sad shape. Lucy, with her psychiatric degree, is only too eager to help once she's received her five cents, of course. And then she asks Charlie, what seems to be the problem? To which Charlie says, I know I should be happy, because it's Christmas, but I'm not. So, embracing her inner psychoanalyst, Lucy posits that if they can just begin to name Charlie's fears, then they'll start to address the problem. So next comes a barrage of questions. Are you afraid of responsibility? She asks. If so, then that's hypogenophobia. I don't think that's quite it, Charlie answers. Are you afraid of staircases, the ocean, cats? None of them seem to catch Charlie's attention. But then she asks, do you have pantophobia? And so Charlie says, what's that? The fear of everything. That's it, Charlie yells, sending Lucy flying into a nearby snowbank. Pantophobia, the fear of everything. Do you feel a bit like Charlie these days? That sense of fear that maybe you can't even put your finger on. Let me pull a Lucy and ask you what it is that you fear today. Maybe you're afraid of where your next paycheck will come from. You're afraid of being pulled into your supervisor's office for that dreaded downsizing, going a different direction speech. You're afraid you'll never be able to afford a house maybe attuned to Omicron and what's happening with the stock market, economic anxiety. Or maybe you're afraid that what's happened in Princeton and Merritt, B.C. is becoming the norm. You've heard Greta Thunberg, you've seen documentaries, and you're afraid the earth is orbiting into irreparable damage, eco-anxiety. Or... Maybe it's COVID anxiety syndrome. You eye the status of cases chart. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you're laboring at a hospital, worked to the ground. Or maybe you're a bit like me. Pantophobia. Sometimes 
It's like fear constricts your whole body and you don't even know why. I am not a professional. (laughs) I'm just playing a Lucy card here. But I don't think I need to charge you five cents to tell you what we already know. We have a lot to fear. But Zachariah understands. Zachariah has a lot to fear too. In verse 5, it says, It is the time of Herod, king of Judea. It's one of those lines we can just quickly read over. But this tells us that this is a time of political instability. Herod is not some kind ruler. He sits on a throne claimed by blood. He domineers the Jews. He's allegiant to the tyrannical Rome. And these opening words show us that this whole time is a time of fear, of hostility, of rumors, of wars. Zechariah has a lot to fear. In verse 7, he and his wife Elizabeth were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. So Zechariah and Elizabeth know the pains of false hopes. There aren't pregnancy tests, but they know the ache of time going by without any promising signs. They know the hurt of seeing their friends move on, start families, and feel that life is passing them by. They have a lot to fear. The fear of never seeing their deepest longing realized. Of having a child of their own to hold. And to make matters worse, time is ticking. In fact, verse 7 also tells us they were very old. Zechariah's health is going. There's more pangs in his back. More wrinkles framing Elizabeth's face. And as the brevity of life dawns, I wonder what Zechariah is thinking. Does he fear getting sick? Does he fear being bedridden, dependent on others? And Zechariah is a committed Jewish priest. He's a man known for his faith in the community. But I wonder as he starts to face death and all the pains of life, is he still full of faith or does he begin to doubt? In fact, it's been 400 years 400 years, and the Jewish people have heard hide nor hair of God's promised Messiah. So I wonder if Zechariah thinks God is MIA. Zechariah's got a lot to fear. Verse 9, he was chosen to go into the temple and burn incense. This isn't lighting an advent candle in church. This is Zechariah going into the ornate temple using tongs to remove the ashes of a burnt up animal from the altar of sacrifice upon which these still smoking coals he dumps sweet smelling perfume and moves deeper into the temple to the altar of incense plated in gold. 18,000 priest served alongside Zechariah. So to be chosen for this task is literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. But that is a lot of pressure. And so I wonder if Zechariah is afraid he's going to mess up. Forget one of the regulations and profane the temple. I wonder if as he is faced with the terrifying holiness of God, he's filled with fear He's got a lot to fear. And then to top it all off, in verse 11, an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar. First, he is alone. And then, wham! Suddenly, this figure stands next to that altar. or It hovers or floats, whatever angels do. But this is an angel, a messenger of God. God's spokes being. And this angel has a name, Gabriel. And we don't know what Gabriel looks like, but I'm 
confident that we can rule out something like this photo. Because in the Bible, angels, uh, it's kind of hard to explain, okay? So for example, angels in Ezekiel are pictured as having interlocking wheels of eyes. So the tradition of picturing angels as baby-faced, nearly naked human birds comes more from the pages of history than the Bible. But here's my point. Gabriel, whatever he looks like, is scary. Gabriel means man of God. And his introduction is, I am the one standing in the presence of God. However Gabriel looks, it causes Zachariah's knees to knock. Zechariah has a lot to fear, including the angelic visit itself. And yet, and yet, although Zechariah has a lot to fear, he uses his fear as fodder for prayer. Zechariah has a lot to fear, which means he has a lot to pray about. No doubt, he and Elizabeth had one prayer that they prayed every day for a child. And it never got scratched off the list. They brought this longing to God again and again and again. And I think we can all relate to Zechariah. We all have a prayer like that. Maybe it's a lonely prayer, a prayer for a partner, a prayer for a spouse, a prayer for a wayward child, for a job, a prayer for God to just show Himself to us. Whatever those prayers are, Zechariah knows what it's like. And the priests, as they went about their duties, were praying. And so maybe as Zechariah watches the ashes burn on the altar, he's like, like a man sitting at a bonfire with God. Perhaps as the flames flicker, he tells God how his faith is smoldering out. And maybe as the light dances on his face, he begs God to send the long ago promised deliverer of his people. What we do know is this, that incense is like prayer. That as the sweet smell of incense fills Zechariah's nostrils and the smoke wafts up, so his prayers rise up to God. His prayers, a delicious scent to the Lord. Zechariah converts his dread to devotion, his anxieties to intercession. And as Gabriel stands at the altar, it's a portrait A portrait of how God's angels have kept watch over his fiery prayers all these years. And as Gabriel speaks over Zechariah, it's like he's speaking over all of Israel. Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Because Israel, they have been filled with fear. Oppressed, gutted, despised. God promised them long ago that the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, would come. And for them, all these years, it probably felt like they were infertile. And God's promise, this longing. Yet, Gabriel comes and says, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Through all those cycles around the sun, through all the strife, all the turmoil, All of Israel's pleas did not go unheard. They had God's ear. They had God's heart. Don't fear. God hears. And Zechariah will be the father of John the Baptist. Verse 17. John will go on before the Lord. 
and the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the disobedient, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord in one promise. God answers two of Zechariah's prayers. For a son and for a Savior. Because John the Baptist will be the foreword, the forerunner to Jesus Christ the Savior. Don't fear. God hears. And so maybe Lucy was on to something. If we'd begin to name our fears, we get somewhere. But we don't we don't name them to the void. We don't show them in the valley to hear our own echo come back. We pray our fears to a listening and loving ear. Don't fear. God hears. Don't be afraid, Ryan. Your prayer has been heard. You know, our imaginations are gifts from God. And they can be used in prayer to draw us into relationship with God. And I want us to use our imaginations this morning to put ourselves in Zachariah's scene. And so in a minute, I'm going to get everybody to close their eyes. But before I do that, I want you to check out this photo. This is a representation of the altar of incense upon which Zachariah put the incense. Um, Zachariah was praying in front of it and Gabriel appeared next to it. So get that kind of in your mind. And go ahead and close your eyes. Every time you do something like this, inevitably there's someone that's peeking. So nope, everybody close your eyes, all right, everybody. Um, But the deal is to not fall asleep either, okay? So, I want you to imagine yourself standing before that shiny altar. Do you feel the heat emitting from it? Do you smell the smoke? And I want to ask you, what is it you fear? I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would examine our, our minds, our attitudes, our behaviors. And I want to invite you to name what you fear to God. It's okay to be afraid. But tell God what you fear. Are you worried about money, COVID, the environment, your kids? Or maybe do you fear that God is out to get you? Do you fear that God's forsaken and abandoned you? Tell God what you fear. And now, I'm going to get you to do something really weird, okay? I want you to take your fears and liquefy them and put them in a jar. I want you to pound them down to dust and put them in a bowl. And I want you to take those fears and pour them on the altar. To the flames flicker. Even though those fears may be dark and ugly, do you smell the sweetness and see the smoke wafting your prayers going up to God? And here is Gabriel. He radiates as one who stands in God's presence. Gabriel is a messenger of God. And do you know what that means? That means that if God has sent a messenger, God has heard your message. God has heard your prayer. And now, God is speaking over you. Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Don't fear. God hears. Go ahead and open your eyes. If you were asleep, wake up. You know, Gabriel came after a lifetime of Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayers and centuries of Israel's longing for a Savior. God hears our fears, but that doesn't mean It's an answer right away. But what we do know is we have God's ear. That God hears us and answers in season. Zechariah's fears of being childless 
and Israel's fears of being forsaken by God were answered in Christmas in a surprising way through the coming of Christ. Maybe it could be the same with our fears. Revelation 5.8 says this of God's throne room. The four living creatures, which are angels, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, Jesus. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the people, which are your prayers. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy, Jesus, to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with it. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, every language and people and nation. Every last fear we bring to God in prayer is collected by the angels of heaven And it's an opportunity for Advent. It's an opportunity for a surprising coming of Christ. A nativity in your online banking portal. The Prince of Peace birthed in the midst of your conflict. The creator of the universe gowned up in the hospital room. Because fear has come into our world like a tea bag. And it is steeping strong and angsty tea. But what's way better is that this Christmas, God has sent a messenger through His Word to remind us, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. And the best news yet is that Jesus, God's Son, came down to steep our world in redemption and restoration. And it's not just our personal fears that God hears. It is the whole groaning of the whole screaming world that God has heard. And so God came into it in human flesh. Don't be afraid. This Christmas, we carry forth Jesus' mission. We lend our ears to the broken, the hurting, the trembling. We listen as God listens to us. And we usher people to the altar to bring their fears as fodder for the fire of prayer. This Christmas, this whole year, whenever we're Charlie Brown in it, the Spirit of God will help us convert our fears to prayers. And so, journal, cry, shout, whatever you need to do, pray into the canal, the divine ear. Don't be afraid, Bay Park. Your fears are heard by God. Your prayer has been heard. Let's pray. God, so often it feels as though when we're praying, We're just lobbing words into an empty room. We confess, God, that so often it feels that you're not there, that we're praying into the void. But God, I pray that you would open up our eyes, that you'd help us to experience your presence right here, right there with us. And when we can't see it. Help us to go to the manger, to God birthed into the world to be with us. God, help us take all these fears and bring them to you in prayer. And help us to listen to others well as you listen to us. Jesus' name. Amen. Lizzie. Thank you, Ryan, for sharing the truth of God's Word with us this morning. And as the video showed mid-service, it said, 
As you see the Christmas lights this season, think about the light of the world, Jesus Christ, who came into this darkness to save our souls, to redeem us. As you receive a gift on Christmas, let's think of the true gift of God, of Jesus Christ. Let's not let our fears hinder us or stop us from being a light as well, as we are ambassadors for Christ. Let's not let our fears stop us from loving on people, encouraging people, sacrificing of our time and our energy to reach out and touch someone's lives in the next days and weeks to come as we celebrate with joy the Christmas season, as we celebrate with peace. And for some of us, it's a hard season, so reach out and encourage each other. And I bless you this morning. I say that um, there's a verse that says, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his strength, his peace, and his joy be in and work through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week ahead, everyone. And you call the sun to rise, and you lay it down to